right, let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. I pray, O oh Lord, that you fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to preach your word boldly and correctly and, cl and clearly also. And help us to assimilate your word and not just be hearers, but also do us of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Food and Fornication. Food and Fornication. Let's see uh, right there, I'll focus on verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. The Bible says, Meats for the belly, and the belly for meat. But God shall destroy both eat and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So at the end there, where the Bible, where the Bible says, um, glorify God in your body. What is God trying to say? God is saying, in your body, magnify me, honor me, give me great praise. Through your body, I should be glorified. People should look at your body and glorify the Lord. So honor God with your body. Uh, the misconception about our body is that, you know, some people uh, have this misconception that the flesh or your body is your enemy. It's, oh yeah, just attack your body. Your body is your enemy. It's evil. It's all of that. No doubt, yes, there's no good thing that dwelleth in the flesh, as the Bible says, uh, but you're not supposed to hate your flesh. It, uh, and it's not by the will of your flesh that you got saved, obviously, because it's not by the will of man, it's not by the will of your flesh. It's by the Spirit of God. But our flesh, understand that, is corrupt because of sin. Sin is the problem here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, you don't have to open it, I'll just quote it. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So the, the fl flesh is corrupt, but God needs our flesh because sin is the problem. So when you get rid of sin, when you stop uh, going, falling for the lust of the flesh or walking according to the lust of the flesh, which lust against the spirit, then God can use your flesh to do great and mighty things. Uh, the, open to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The thing with the flesh is that sin can only walk through the flesh. It cannot walk through the spirit because he that is born of God cannot sin. So, and we are all sinners. So sin walks through the flesh. The flesh manifests the, the, uh, the sins that the Bible listed in our Bible reading there. So, therefore, we should not give in to the desires of the flesh. We should die to flesh daily. In Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 16 to 17. The Bible says, This I say then, Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see? For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That ye would. So, the flesh lusted against the flesh, against the spirit. And we want to do the right things. How are we going to do the right things? With our body. Right? <laughs> want to uh, love our neighbors as we love ourselves, you know, uh, provide for our own. We want to do the right things, but the, 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 the flesh, the lust of the flesh doesn't want us to do the right things. But if we can put the body under, or put under our body, as Paul said, then uh, we can walk in the spirit and have our body in control and uh, discipline our body. So we should use our body for the Lord. Uh, open to Matthew 26 verse 41 Matthew 26 41 remember that Jesus also had flesh and blood his flesh wasn't corrupted he wasn't uh, he didn't he lived without sin he didn't commit any sin uh, the Bible says in Matthew 26 41 watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is evil no but the flesh is weak so you want to empower your flesh to do what the spirit says. The spirit wants to do. So the spirit is willing to do something. The flesh is not willing to do that. But if we can make the flesh obedient to the spirit, to every command of the word of God, then uh, we can do great things with our body. Then God will use our body. In fact, the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says. Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. As you open there. Look at what verse 19 of our Bible reading says, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So clearly God wants our body. God has purchased both body and spirit. Right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, the Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So you're not supposed to defile your body because God owns your body. That's how important your body is, right? I'm talking about food and fornication here. And I'm going to get to the two F's. But let's finish up here. So how do you glorify God in your body? By everything we do. Everything we do, we glorify God. When we sleep, we eat, we walk, we play, we laugh. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's how we glorify God in our body. And in St. Corinthians, he was writing to them about their body, how they use their body, how to glorify God, that your body is a temple of God. Because they were having a problem in the Corinthian church there. All right, let's go to food and fornication. First one is food. Food. You know, meat commended us not to God. I mean, whether we eat meat or we don't eat meat, it, it doesn't make us better or worse in, in the eyes of the Lord. So our focus here is to please God above pleasing yourself. Please God above pleasing yourself. First John chapter 4, verse 20. Open there. How do you know that you love God? How do you know that you, uh, you're pleasing God? It's by loving your brother. It's by obeying what God says. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself. First John 4, 20 and 21. The Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he had not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So, open to 1 Corinthians 8. So what I'm trying to say here is, or what the Bible is saying, is that if you say you love God, you love your brother. And I'm talking in respect of food. What you put in your body, what you eat, um, how it affects your brother, how it affects how it affects you from doing the right things. You know, you might have so much to eat and you don't want to share with your brother or because you want to please yourself instead of pleasing God. So you have to think about your neighbors. You have to think about what God requires of you. Controlling your appetite is required by the Lord. Control your appetite. Control what, how you eat. Yes, it doesn't make you any better or worse in the eyes of God because, you know, it's the spirit. The flesh profited nothing, right? Uh, but God requires things from us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So you don't want your brother to be offended by what you eat. In 1 Corinthians 4, uh, sorry, in Romans 4, 21, Romans 14, 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. So this is the same thing Paul is repeating to the churches. As he's writing to letters to churches, repeating the same things, reminding them. So it's what you eat, how it affects your brother, uh, uh, or, uh, how it affects the brethren, then you should caution how you eat. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Philippians 4, verse 5. And that is talking about moderation. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The important thing here I want to point out is, let it be known unto all men. It in, your moderation should not be like your prayer life. Your moderation should not be like your giving. You know, your right hand should not know what your left hand is doing. But the Bible is saying your moderation should be known unto all men. That, you know, and focusing on eating, how you eat. <laughs> You know, your moderation will be known to you, uh, to all men, whether, whether you like it or not. Because if you eat too much, it's just going to show on you. <laughs> whether you like it or not. Uh, you, you, you don't go to places where they are starving or where there's war, and you see obese people saying, oh yeah, we're starving, there's a lot, there's no food. It doesn't happen. It's only in America that you see obese people on the line for food. It's only in America. That shows you, that tells you a whole lot, that they are not starving. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, so, but God is saying, let your moderation be known unto all men. So, mind how you eat. Uh, why am I saying this? Because you have to understand that food was and still is one of the best ways to pleasure the flesh. Back, uh, back then when we didn't have so much distractions, you know, pleasures of the world. I mean, there's so much right now. But back then, uh, there, there were still pleasures of the world. And one of them was food. You know, different kinds of food. Uh, that was a pleasure. That's how you pleasure yourself when you eat different things. If I'm drinking juice, 
I mean, the Bible calls wine. It's pleasuring yourself. You can drink wine and be merry. <laughs> so right now, juice, everyone has juice. So, But food is still a pleasure to our flesh. Um, so food uh, help, uh, does not just help us to keep going, but it helps us to pleasure ourselves when we feel like pleasuring ourselves. If not, we'd be like robots. You know, just get a charge. <laughs> eat your nutrients. You know, like dogs, basically. If dogs, they eat the same food every day, every morning, night, evening, the same food, the same food, the same food. And they're dogs, they're fine. Well-balanced diet, but it's the same food. The taste in their mouth. Open to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And that's why restaurants will never go out of business. Because you want to try this restaurant, you want to try that restaurant, that restaurant. You know, different kinds of food. Oh, have you tried this Indian food, Mexican food? It's not because you're searching for nutrients. It's not because you're hungry. Why? It's because you want to pleasure yourself. So food is a way of pleasuring the body. I want you to look at it that way also. So when the Bible is saying, let your moderation be known, or uh, mind how you eat, it's talking about pleasuring your body. So learn to please God over pleasing your flesh. Uh, look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 18. And Psalm 78. By the way, in Psalm 78, the Bible is talking about the story of the Israelites when they were uh, going through the wilderness, if you remember, in Exodus. And, and uh, God was giving them manna, and they didn't, manna was not sufficient for them. So they desired to eat a different kind of food. Now, if God is giving you manna for 40 years, that tells me that manna is the best square meal you can ever eat. <laughs> right? And they survived, they, they were fine for 40 years in the wilderness. It, it's like it's like giving the dog a balanced diet, right? It's just it's just gonna keep them going. They're, they're in the wilderness all this time, and they're eating manna, so it's just a balanced, perfect diet. But the desire of pleasure, pleasuring themselves by food, is is uh, the problem they have. Let's read the story in Psalm seventy-eight. I'll start from verse eighteen. The Bible says, "And they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they speak against God. They said." Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? So they were tempting God, saying, can God do this? Can God give us food? Not just manna. I mean, when you're getting so much blessings, blessings that money cannot buy, you start asking, can God give me things that money can buy? Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, let's keep reading. Let's see what the Holy Spirit said through the psalmist. Verse 20, Behold, he smote the rock that waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wrong. So uh, a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Verse 23. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and he had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his pow power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and feathered fowls as like the sand of the sea. And he let in, and he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations. So they did eat, and they were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their loss, but while their meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. So what is the Bible trying to say? God, I mean, they witnessed that God did miracles in their life. God did great things for them. Oh, he smote the rock and water gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give us food? I mean, he did the miraculous, but can he give us flesh? Can he give us bread? He's showing you that he can do so much more than that. But you're doubting that he, can he give you the ones that money can buy? <laughs> right? So we have to, don't tempt God in that thinking and say, oh God, you've done all these great things for me. You've given me a wife. You've given me a family. You've given me a church. But can you give me this? Something money can buy. So that is tempting God in your heart. Now on top of that, God gave them that. He overfilled them with it. He gave them so much. And the Bible says that as the food was in their mouth, he punished them. And he slew the fattest of them. You see? Moderation. 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. <laughs> so, because all of them ate, I'm sure there was not one person that said, you know what, I'm not eating this. God's going to punish All of the, it was all over. I mean, this, this thing was co covered their camp like the sand of the sea. And you've gone to the beach, right? <laughs> so that's how it covered their, their camp. They all ate, but the fattest of them, the ones that really wanted this because of their loss, because of their greed for this. So think about food and be careful with food. Open to some uh, Proverbs 23, I mean. Proverbs 23. Remember, glorify God with food like Daniel did. Daniel refused to eat of the king's table. So glorify God that way. Honor God that way. Hey, I'm not going to eat with those kind of people. I'm not going to eat that kind of food that is sacrificed to idols. And they still do that. The, uh, what do you call that Islam thing? Ramadan. Ramadan. There you go. The Ramadan. That's a good example. Well, I'm not going to eat with them. Um, heed the warnings in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 23, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. So be careful with your appetite. Let your moderation be known not to all men. So don't live a life of regret like Esau. And I'm not going to go into Esau's story because of time. Esau, he lived a life of regret. He sold his birthright for a pot of pottage. <laughs> or a plate of pottage, I don't know. For food. You sell your birthright. You, you get blinded because of your desire of food. All right, let's move on to fornication. Fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is laying with someone you are not married to. It's a perversion of marriage that was instituted by God. Now, adultery is different from fornication. Adultery is a married person laying with someone that he or she is not married to. Right? So a married person laying with someone that he or she is not married to. Fornication is laying with someone that you're not married to. Period. So, uh, I'm not going to discuss the other perversions of fornication. I'm just going to focus on what the church <laughs> can possibly fall into. Um, but false Bibles, I want to warn you about false Bibles. I try to interject that every time uh, I get the opportunity. False Bibles, they avoid the terms fornication and adultery. What do they say? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is just painting it with a broad brush. It could mean anything. I mean, looking at someone somehow is sexual immorality. Touching someone is sexual. That's not what God is talking about. He's talking about fornication and he's talking about adultery. When the Bible means fornication or adultery. Right. But, but they just say sexual immorality. Uh, uh, it's not the same thing. And I want us to understand that. And because of painting a brush with sexual immorality, it gives people the, um, the license to divorce. Because God says uh, you can divorce for in the case of fornication, not adultery. Right. But if those two mean the same thing, then they will divorce for adultery. God, that's that's not a license for divorce. And that is a sermon on its own, you know, fornication. Because when two people are betrothed, in fact, let me just quickly go through it. When two people are betrothed and the man wants to marry the woman and he finds out that once they are betrothed, you know, they are married, right? And he finds out that she has fornication or yeah, uncleanness in her. That means there was fornication before they got married, before they consumed the, the, consummated the marriage. Um, then he can divorce her and say, okay, I'm no more marrying her. You see that? That's what God said. Not after you've married and one year passes, two years passes, you find adultery, you've already married her. <laughs> now, you can go ahead and do what you want to do, but it's not right in the eyes of God. In fact, God does not even want divorce at all. Right. You should forgive. But because of the hardness of our heart. You know, in the beginning, it wasn't so. So, but divorce is another topic. I just wanted to point out that the Bibles, when they use sexual immorality to cover fornication, adultery, and all the other kinds of um, sins, uh, similar sins, it is wrong. And that's why we stick to King James. King James only. Amen? Amen. All right, fornication also spiritually means to worship other gods, to go a whoring, as the Bible says, uh, worshiping other gods spiritually. Fornication is not love. Can say that over and over again. Please let it drill down into your head. Fornication is not love. Because to know love is to know God. Everything else uh, to do with fornication is false, is false God. It's false love. So the person is deceiving you if you're committing fornication and you think the person loves you. Or you think you love the person. You are being deceived. Fornication is not love. Fornication is a perversion of love. 
as I said earlier with marriage, open to Romans chapter 7. Open to Romans chapter 7. Because you're perverting what love is. You're perverting um, the act between a man and his wife. Right? So, the joining of a man and a woman in holy matrimony is symbolical to believers joining with the Lord. So, when a man and a woman joins in holy mat matrimony and they consummate that marriage, that is symbolical to a believer joining with the Lord. In Romans chapter 7 verse 4, the Bible says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You see, it's all symbolical to marriage. We're joined with another. Who is the another? Him that was raised from the dead. And we know him that was raised from the dead. That's Jesus Christ. So we're joined to Jesus Christ so that we can bring forth fruit unto God. That's talking about soul winning. So God uses natural things to explain spiritual things. So the natural thing that he instituted in marriage, we join, we become one with the Lord, and then we can bring forth fruit unto God. That's why someone that's not saved cannot bring forth fruit unto God. Period. An unsaved person cannot bring forth good, good fruits. Or a battery cannot bring forth good fruits. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 again. Back to our Bible reading. 1 Corinthians 6, 16. And if uh, that is what fornication is, perversion of marriage, imagine what adultery is. It's even worse. And that's why adultery goes with what? The death penalty in, uh, according to the laws of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You can see, we're still talking about the consummation of marriage in the right, according to the will of God, in the right place. Mar marriage instituted by God. When you're joined with, uh, with, a, with a harlot, you're perverting marriage. You're perverting what true love is. That's why fornication is not love. It's a perversion of true love. It's a perversion of marriage. Because when we are joined with the Lord, we're one spirit with the Lord. Right. Amen? And also, this is a warning to women. This is a, a, a serious warning to women. Because uh, they easily fall for this. Oh, he loves me so much. No, he does not love you. As I said, it's false. And he might not even know what love is. You know, a man can be deceived. You know, there's some people that are preaching the false gospel. They themselves are deceived. Right. They are not doing it in, you know, with malicious intent. They actually think that what they are doing is right. The Bible says that some people will kill you thinking they are doing God a, a service. <laughs> right? Or second disciples, the persecution you go through. These people will kill you because they are deceived. They are blind. So a man, you think he loves you, women. And uh, committing fornication, he might be deceived. So he might look all sincere, but he does not know what love is. So you know, so don't be deceived. Um, worse yet is if he knows what love is. Like he's going to a living church. He's hearing the Bible. He has heard this sermon. He has read this. He understands it. And he's saved. And he's still doing that. That is even worse because he's intentionally deceiving you. See, <laughs> it's almost better to do it in the world because this guy actually hates you. <laughs> that's what it means. He wants to destroy you. He loves himself so much. Th that's exactly what it means. So be careful if it's even from the church. <laughs> be much more careful. Um, so for, it's a warning to women because you will appear to suffer more outwardly. What do I mean? Emotionally, you will suffer more. Because the Bible has put something in uh, God's word said, he shall rule over you. So when you get joined with somebody else that is not your husband, he can't, it, it, it has that effect on you. So don't get yourself into that. Avoid, Bible says, flee fornication. It's a warning to women. Socially, there's shame that comes upon you compared to a man. I'm talking about this outward suffering that you're going to suffer. There's shame that comes upon you compared to a man. And you have more responsibilities. What if you have a child? What if you have a child? So, and that also limits your opportunities. Why do you think People do abortions, or women uh, easily go for abortions. Why do you think that the abortion rate is so high? It's because of the shame. It's because of the limitations they might have. Oh, I, I can't get married again, or I can't you know, do this, or go to school, or anything they wanted to do in life that they thought. So to them, it limits the opportunities. And that was the same reason, too, because they are bought 
their children because they want better a better life, right? The same reason they sacrifice to Moloch, their children, because they want a better life. You can see abortion is sacrificed to Moloch. And they use the child spiritually and physically. The blood, I mean, it's just nasty. All right. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean men will not suffer. I just said women will suffer more outwardly. Men, God is a just God. This is not, you know, bringing the woman there that committed adultery to Jesus and forget, forget, forgetting about the man. Oh, she was caught right-handed. Where's the guy? Anyway. So, but God is a just God. The men too will suffer. It might not be as outward as women who suffer, but God, <laughs> God will punish the men too in their own different ways. And the thing about uh, the women too, why I'm wanting the women and the men, is that fathers, the Bible says that you should not make your daughter a prostitute. You should not make harlots of your daughter. So this is a responsi responsibility to fathers. I preached last week, Father's Day, you know, fathers, you have a lot of responsibilities. Because if the women, why I want the women is that if the women uh, uh, cautious about this, if the women don't give in to this, then the rate of fornication will reduce unless the society is gone. When society is gone, that means there's rape. But men in a normal society, even in the world, you know, frown on rape, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if the women are cautious of fornication and refuse, then we're going to uh, have less fornication. So that's why it's a responsibility again that falls on the fathers. Treat your daughters well. Because they don't know what love is. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right. Um, let's move on. Open to Judges chapter 19. Judges chapter 19. The thing about fornication also is that God will forgive you. God can forgive you. But the scar will remain much more visibly. The scar of fornication will be there. Emotionally, in everything you do, that scar will be there. And um, it's easier to stay right than to get right. Let me tell you that. Because uh, you get yourself involved in different, with different people intimately, it's harder to come out of that. All right, Judges chapter 19. The Bible has multitudes of warnings against fornication. In Judges chapter 19, a very famous chapter about the Sodomites, right? We have Genesis 19 and Judges 19. And God was like, you know what, I'm just going to stop there. Because the word of God is pure, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So, but the main story here I want to talk about is the concubine. The concubine is someone that is not married to a man, but is living with a man. And as adults, we know what that means. So, uh, look at how a concubine is treated. Just to show you women that he doesn't love you. And the man does not know what love is. Yes, he came all the way to pick up his concubine. And the father could not even protect his daughter. You see, there's just so many wrongs here. <laughs> father could not protect his daughter. The man thought he loved her, but he didn't love her. It looked as if he loved her. Oh, I'm coming to pick you up. Right? If you read the story. I want to start from verse 22. And look at what he did to her. In verse 22. Um, okay, before we get to verse 22. So they were on their way back. From her father's house, the man picked up his concubine on the way back, and they were passing through Benjamin's land, uh, and uh, there were sodomites there. An older guy saw them passing through, and the older guy invited them into his house because he didn't want them to spend the night <laughs> with the sons of Belial, with sodomites in the land, because he knew what would happen to them. So he was trying to save them, just as uh, 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 Lot was trying to save the angels that came. You know, come into my house, don't stay there. It's getting late. You know, it's getting dark. These vampires come out at night. Um, so they were in the house. They were making merry. I'll pick the story up from verse 22. Now as they were making merry, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Now, sons of Belial, you get to a point, according to Romans chapter 1, that you start going after strange flesh, right? You start, you become a sodomite. You get to that point. It's not all sons of Belial that are sodomites. But by the time you get to that point, we can know for sure that they are sodomites. When they are desiring or, or burning the loss after the same sex or the same gender, then you know that, okay, this guy is a sodomite. This guy is a reprobate. But remember, we had sons of Belial, or not say we, David had sons of Belial uh, in his camp. 
and he called her brethren because he hadn't gotten to that point yet, to that state where David would know that, oh wow, this is truly a son of Billion. But the Bible called say that they were sons of Billion. So these men, they have gotten to that point where they are desiring strange flesh. Let's keep going. Verse 23. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to mine house, do not do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. I tried when I was in Genesis 19 to explain how somebody offers his daughter. I, I don't know how someone offers his daughter to these beasts. But I don't know what kind of world we were living in back then. <laughs> but I, I still can't explain how somebody off. I don't, I don't care if you're saved or saved. You know what these people can do. And you're offering your daughters to them. It's amazing. But let's keep reading. Verse 25. So that's what the old man said. Hey, look at the two women. I have a maiden. Right? And I have this concubine. I'll offer you two women. But the, uh, but the man, uh, so don't do this vile thing unto a man. Do it to these two women. In verse 25, but the man would not hearken to him, to the old man. That's what the Bible means. So the man took his concubine. Not the old man now. The man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. You know, vampires hate sunlight, right? So, <laughs> that's why I call them that. But they all, you know, run away. Sun comes out and they're all gone. Because they don't want, their deeds cannot be seen in the light. You see how the physical things of the world uh, explain spiritual things? You want to hide the evil that you're doing. You don't want to come out and let it known to, every, to everyone. So, they literally do it in the night, at dark. Um, so, uh, what did he do to his concubine? How much did he love his concubine? Would you do that to your wife? Do you see that? Open to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. The Bible warns us also, so that's Judge, uh, Judges 19. The Bible warns also what happened to the Israelites because of fornication. So a concubine, as I said, it's someone that's committing fornication with a married man, right? And a married person committing fornication with a married man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, Open to Numbers 25. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 8. The Bible says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. In one day, 23,000 people died because of fornication. That's what the Bible says. In one day. That is God showing his anger or his judgment on fornication. So don't let us not be like them. They were for an example unto us. How many examples do we need? Let's look at that story. Open to Numbers chapter 25. Have some time. Numbers 25. It's not too long. I'll read. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. You see that? So what is fornication? You can see in the Bible also is whoredom. And they call the people... Uh, they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. Because you're joining with the harlot, right? You're joining with the harlot. What's going to happen? You're going to give in to everything they introduce you to. That's, that's the danger of fornication. Verse 3, And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel God is still the same yesterday today and forever right so if this is what angered the Lord this should not be among us this should not be once mentioned in the church right and Moses said unto the judges of Israel slay ye every one his men that were joined to Baal Peor right it's, it, you can see how fornication is now spiritual because you're joined with a hallowed, you're joined with someone that's doing wrong things, and you're not joined with the person's God. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman 
in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So this is what a, a, a man did. I mean, this, this other man, <laughs> he had so much guts to do this. And it's interesting, uh, the, 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 uh, the javelin went through their belly. Uh, that's, you know, food and fornication. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I know it's something to do there. I didn't get the connection, but yeah, just want to show you guys. <laughs> anyway, after this, you know, God killed 23,000 men because of this. And if you read the story in chapter 26, after he killed all of them, he's like, okay, let's number them again. Because remember, this is the book of Numbers, where they started numbering all the Israelites, how many uh, soldiers that they had, men of war. And after killing all these people, it's like, all right, let's do the renumbering. That's how bad it was. And this is right after God finished blessing them through Baal. You know, it was Baal that deceived them to do this. So God finished blessing them through Baal. And uh, is it Baal? Sorry, Baal. <laughs> Through Balaam. Uh, so God is blessing them and giving them all these promises. And they turn around to do fornication and go with other gods physically and spiritually. And God killed 23,000 to show, to set forth an example. And he had to number them again. So the world is deceiving you with fornication. Don't get deceived. The world is trying to deceive the church. The world is trying to deceive believers. Just as Balaam uh, deceived the children of God. Uh, most things in this world point to fornication. For example, 2020, everyone is crying. No high school prom. Really? really? What, what, what does that point towards? What have you achieved after high school? Tell me. I mean, <laughs> it's just basic education. This is something you can learn at home. But, oh, yeah, we didn't celebrate or high school prom, no high school. They're all sad about that. And that is pointing towards fornication. That's when many people experience it for the first time. It's, it's dangerous. Um, or the college lifestyle. That's what the world points towards. Just that, that's what college is about. Just how different people. <laughs> it, it's amazing. Or Netflix and chill, right? That's another one. If you don't know about it, sorry for messing up your head. <laughs> um, so the world and from fornication, what goes next? Moving after, going after strange flesh. Going after strange flesh. Uh, how many more examples do you need from the Bible to see that fornication is wrong and God? Is angry or hates fornication so much. Over to Second Chronicles chapter twenty-one. God had made it very clear: fornication is used to entrap people, to entrap the children of God, to cause them to follow false gods, worship other gods, whether it's yourself, whether it's mammon, to worship false gods, or even literally bow. Go, you know, you might be in a Baptist church, saved. You're not sure. You, you know, you grew up saved, but you go marry a Catholic. <laughs> right? It now leads you. Maybe you're committing fornication and you're like, oh no, I have to marry this person. And now the fornication will lead you to go bow down to a false god. God's not going to be happy, to, happy with you. Yes, you're saved, but God's not going to be happy with you. So fornication leads people to false gods, leads people to sin against God. It's an entrapment. In 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 11, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 11, is one of the kings, I think, Jehoshaphat's Jeho son, Jehoram or so, Bible says, moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah there too. You see that? So, to worship false God easily blinds you with fornication. Open to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. This is a let, a, the letters Jesus wrote to the churches. Churches in Pergamos, churches in Thyatira, the same thing. Let's look at the church in Pergamos, Revelation 2, 14. The Bible says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Just talked about the doctrine of Balaam. In order for God to punish, or for, for the uh, prophet, who was this, the false prophet, to deceive the people of God, what does he do? Cause them to commit fornication. So I want to deceive the people of God. I want to either get their money or line up my pockets. Basically, he was trying to line up his pockets with their money. So what did he allow? Fornication. 
Show them how to commit fornication. That is the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication? It's always aligned with sacrificing to idols. Look at what God said to Thyatira in verse 20, second, uh, sorry, Revelation 2 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. Uh, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery. So, you see, it grows from fornication. What does it lead to adultery? Remember, the punishment for fornication, according to the Bible, is that the man should marry the woman. I mean, you guys think you love each other, then you actually have to love each other. Now, if her father does not agree to that, then the man has to pay uh, a, a, a bride price, you know, because the woman... It's believed or it's understood that the man that will marry the woman will not want to pay a full bribe price. See how it affects the woman. <laughs> so that's what I keep saying. So, but from fornication, God is angry with fornication because what does it lead to? Adultery. You know, every man is, uh, is like a horse named after his neighbor, as the Bible says in Jeremiah. You name after your neighbor's wife because living in fornication is not living in adultery, then after that, that's not good enough for you. It now goes into, you know, if you're saved, become reprobate, sodomite. So God does not want that because he will not allow it to get there. If you start living like that, God will kill, kill his people. God will. You live in sin, God will kill you. Because you're not going to get to that reprobate state where he will reject you. He will rather send you to heaven. All right, let, let me keep reading here. Verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. He's talking to the church here. You see that? And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the, the, the reins and the heart. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So three fornication. In conclusion, remember, we are bought with a price. Food and fornication is something, once we can master those, our body, <laughs> our, our body will be able to glorify God. So that those, those are the two F's. Food, if you can control food in your body, control how you eat, what you eat, when you eat. And because that is pleasing to the body. I mean, you should eat well, eat good food. I'm not saying, oh, just eat junk. That, that's actually a sin too, because you need to take care of your body. So eat good food, but in moderation. And what you eat, don't just decide. Oh, it's been a long time, red lobster, or oh, forgot a child. I like, just, I just, you know, it's been a very long time. No, just eat good food and don't let that desire for food uh, blind you. Then you cannot control your flesh. It will lead. It will, your flesh will now control, uh, override the spirit, and you start walking in the flesh, obeying the lust of the flesh. So food is kind of like a signal to you. And fornication that will just lead to. <laughs> you're, you're joining yourself with false gods. All right, so we're bought with a price. Salvation is a free gift. In fact, that's a tautology. Tautology means repeating, uh, like having two words consecutive that have the same meaning. So free gift. Gift is inherently free. So as you say, salvation is a gift. As the Bible says, the Bible doesn't say it's a free gift. The Bible says it's a gift. So salvation is a gift. Use good grammar because if you're out there so winning and it says it's a free gift, in your mind you're thinking, hmm, are you sure this gift is free? <laughs> so just say it's a gift and explain what a gift is. It's free. So it's, so I don't want to say that to touch you. Salvation is a gift to us, but Jesus paid the price for it. Amen? And this is why we love him. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. So we love him because he first loved us. So food is very important. I'm not playing down on food. In fact, I said we should eat well. But the Bible says man cannot live by bread alone. That means man needs bread to live. You see that? <laughs> so man cannot live by bread alone. So uh, even when Elijah, Elijah was uh, like, God kill me. This is after he killed all the, um, the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to find you. And what you did to this prophet, I'm going to do unto you. And Elijah was running away and he's like, God, just take my life. You know, just kill me. God told, what did he tell Elijah? You need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> he just relax. Just, just eat because your journey is far. <laughs> so food is important. It's not this time God was like, 
oh, don't you know me? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will protect you. Yeah, he wasn't saying that. He wasn't telling Elijah what he told Jeremiah. I will make you a fence city. Uh, you know, he wasn't saying that. He just said eat. <laughs> so food is important. Don't get me wrong. But man cannot live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So there must be moderation. The lack of moderation will eventually destroy any person. And moderation also doesn't mean any. Uh, it means to be in the middle, not on either extreme. Not to eat too much and not to eat too little. So you know, I'm not eating. Then you will not have strength to go somewhere winning. You won't finish the, the, the round. You'll be tired. <laughs> you be tired. There are some people I was, talking, I was talking to and they didn't seem interested at first. And if I'm, you don't have the strength, you're like, oh, you're not interested. Just walk up. There's people I was talking to, they're not interested. And at the end, they, 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 uh, they got saved. Because, you know, you try to persuade. The Bible says persuading men. Persuade them. But if you're tired, you just, you just go. So eat. <laughs> Uh, but you need the word of God also. It should be in moderation. Look at First Timothy chapter five verse twenty-four. First Timothy chapter five verse twenty-four. Uh, warning you uh, about there are some sins. You know, food is just one about being fat or how you eat. There are some sins that go before us, and it's clear to everybody. In First Timothy five twenty-four, I'll just read it. The Bible says, "Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment." And some men, they follow after. What is this Bible is trying to say? There are some sins you commit and everybody just sees it. You cannot hide it. Right? It, you're in bondage to that sin. Everybody knows. And speaking of food in particular, they, everyone just sees your problem. It's as simple as that. So that food is one of them. And God made, I believe God made this obvious to us to tell us and to show everybody, okay, this person, you know, needs control. Now, I know in some cases it's gen genetics or it's a disease or you're going through something. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying in general. Because any society that is lacking food is very clear the society is lacking food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and any society that is overfed is very clear that the society is overfed. It's, you can't hide it. It's, it's. It's natural. So you, you can't have someone that is suffering from a disease and is just so far. Oh, yeah, his disease is that he's so fat. Like anything he eats just multiplies in his body. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. So I'm just warning us about that. And I, hey, I'm not perfect here in this case. I'm talking to myself too, so <laughs> don't feel bad. <laughs> and it's not necessarily for shame. It's not necessarily for shame that this uh, overeating or this sin I'm talking about is for our health also. It's a warning to our health. Because look at the COVID-19. Do you know it affected more obese people than normal people? Yeah. So it's for your health also. Uh, so mind how you eat for your moderation. Because as I said, God owns our body. Our body is not our own. And what is happening to us? Misinformation is destroying many lives. Mis misinformation. Understand that you are what you eat. So know what is going into your body. It's a profound statement that you are what you eat. Know what's going into your body. Uh, you are what you eat physically and spiritually. Physically, you know we're made of dust. So we should eat the things that God made too. Right? God made us from the dust of the earth. All the other things too. God made everything goes back to the dust. So let's eat those things. Not just eating chemically processed things. <laughs> right? Eat the natural things. That will help you because you are what you eat. So if you want to be healthy, how God made you, how God made your body to run, then eat nat nat uh, most natural things as much as possible. Um, spiritually, are you reading the word of God? Or are you in the world? You are what you eat spiritually also. Uh, another misinformation is the food pyramid. Food pyramid. That was made by America as this is the best thing to eat, bread, and do your research. I'm not going to come out here and teach you about the food pyramid, but I want to challenge you to do your research about food pyramid, the kind of bread that we eat. Bread that we eat today is not the same bread that they, they ate in the Bible. When the Bible talks about your daily bread, our bread is lacks nutrients, a whole bunch of nutrients. It's just like flour and <laughs> But their bread was very nutritious. So do your research about what you're eating, what you're putting into your body. And you say, oh, where does the Bible say do your research? The Bible says prove all things. Prove all things. You're following the fruit pyramid. You're eating, oh, uh, cereal in the morning, bread in the morning. Uh, no. Do your research before you just start following what everybody's eating. Must you eat cereal in the morning? 
do your research. Prove these things before you, uh, before you consume it. Uh, and on top of that, I'm not saying you should not enjoy what God has provided. Yes, we cannot eat like dogs, eating the same thing over and over again just because it has nutrients. Yeah, we can enjoy. <laughs> enjoy different kinds of food, but be content with God, what God has provided for you. Amen? So, God has given you the ability to eat different kinds of food. Okay, that's fine. But don't let your desire for that not uh, lead you to be covetous or lead you to be discontent with what God has given you. Amen? So, enjoy what God has given you while glorifying the Lord. It must glorify God. Uh, that means it must be in His will, according to His word, and love of God shown by loving your neighbor. Right? So you're loving God. How you show that? By loving your neighbor. According to his will, that's what the word of God says. And the same goes for fornication. God has given us the desire or the burn. Open to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. What do I mean by the burn? In 1 Corinthians 7, 8 and 9, the Bible says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. You know, Paul was not unmarried. That's what he means. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So God has given us that desire, that burn, and if you cannot contain it, then get married. That's what the Bible says. Get married. So don't deceive yourself in the beginning and then fall into fornication. Hebrews 13 verse 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Remember what homemonging is? Remember Numbers chapter 25, verse 1? And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So, but fornication, uh, fornicators, oh, hey, fornicators and adulterers, <laughs> that's why I call it homemonging. <laughs> God will judge. Fornication, God will judge it. Marriage, the, the marriage is honorable. What did God say? Glorify me in your body. Honor God with your body. Marriage is honorable. And the bed on the file. Don't believe what the Catholics are telling you. Oh, after, you know, you should only do it for the production. No, you should enjoy what God has given you according to his will. And be content with your wife or your husband. Right? According to his will, enjoy it. Food too, according to his will, enjoy it. And be content with what he has given you. Food and fornication. So God needs our body here on earth to work. And that's no small statement. God needs our body. Uh, in fact, only man can save man. Remember the foolishness of preaching? That is man preaching to another man. The eunuch said, how can I uh, understand this unless some man show me, right? How will I understand what is being said? And that was really in Hebrews, uh, sorry, Isaiah 53. If you read Isaiah 53 right now, you're just going to understand it because you're saved. But that's how much God needs our physical body because only a physical man that can save another man. No angel or spirit. In fact, when Jesus saved people, he was man. He was man and God. But he was full flesh and blood, and blood just as we are. Amen? So we are to love one another. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Remember, we are workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are to love one another and we need our body to do that. Oh, if you see a, a man that is sick or a man that is without food or without clothes and you tell him, oh, be well, God bless you. <laughs> God's word can do that. He can read the Bible and just see that, oh, be well, God will bless you, worry not. <laughs> but he needs us, a physical body that is going to help this man. So God needs your body. He doesn't need you bedridden. He doesn't need you, you know, sitting at home, tired, or you're not be able to do anything. He needs you healthy. He owns your body. So let the two F's, food and fornication, stand as a warning to us. Let them stand as a warning. Being given food, sorry, being given to food is a sign that you're not in control of your flesh. And that's where fasting will come into place. Fasting is an order in that point. You see, you cannot control your flesh. Maybe you should try fasting. And you don't have to fast three days straight. Start off saying, I'm going to miss morning food. I'm going to miss my breakfast. Or I'm going to, I'm going to skip my lunch. Start easy and grow from there. No child just stands up and starts walking. <laughs> they take one, two, three steps and fall before they start jumping on the cell. <laughs> right? So it doesn't just happen that way. 
So, um, walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. So, the food, giving to flesh, giving to food shows that you're losing control of the flesh. The flesh is, you're not putting the flesh under. And fornication is a sign that destruction is near. You start living in fornication, destruction is near. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. As you open there, I'll read you Jude 1 7. Jude 1 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So they started off with fornication and it leads to going after strange flesh. So you start going in fornication, you're saved as a church, God's not going to let you go after strange flesh because that's, that means he has rejected your mind. He's going to kill you. Destruction is near if you want to leave in fornication. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll read the first five verses. The Bible says in verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. We're talking about the church here. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. See, because in the church, if you don't covet, the danger is that it will go worse than even what the world is doing. <laughs> because the devil, he, when the sons of God gathered, the devil was among them. When the sons of God gathered, the devil was among them. <laughs> He's the accuser of the brethren. He deceives the brethren. So you want to point it out in church. No fornication. Because destruction is near. Destruction is near. Verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and are not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I, for I verily absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that had so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So destruction is near when you start living fornication. That is God's mind towards it. He's been very clear in the Old Testament. He's been very clear in the New Testament. And you can see because of fornication going on in church in 1 Corinthians, first of all, Paul started off telling them, if you read the whole letter of Corinthians, started off telling them, you guys are carnal. Oh, and for Paul and for Apollos, that's carnality. You're in the flesh. You can never control your flesh. And what do you know by chapter 5? He's telling them, it's reported. There's fornication going on. It's open. Everyone knows that. They cannot control their flesh. They are eating. They cannot control it. Food and fornication. And look at what's going on. And that's why he keeps on them. Fornication, 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 fornication. It will not happen in this church. Amen? Because I don't want God's destruction to be at our door. God wrote it in the letters to the churches. Multiple churches had that going on in their church. So finally, what does the Bible want us? The last two verses of our Bible reading, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with the prize, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about food and fornication. Help us, O oh Lord, to see the warning signs. And help us, O oh Lord, not to put ourselves in uh, the chopping line. Uh, help us as a church. It's not by might, it's not by powers, but by your spirit. I pray, O oh Lord, that you help us to fear you uh, so that we can love you how uh, you ought to be loved. We'll obey your commandments. And we can love one another, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray, O oh Lord, as we go, that you go with us, you bless us, and give us our, uh, a blessing for this week. Protect us, O oh Lord, and keep us safe, and preserve us, provide for us. Uh, I pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you give us strength to do your work as a church, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father, for all you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.